Great. Welcome, everybody. If I can ask you to please train your attention to the front. Uh, so I have just been told that I am doing introduction, um, which is fantastic. And I know a lot about what it is, um, so it's very convenient for me. Uh, my name is Jeff Tatoy. I'm the chairperson of SICE Western Cape. And it is an honor to be hosting the SICE Western Cape branch meeting for September here in Stellenbosch. We've been wanting Stellenbosch meeting for ages. And so we're thrilled Prof. Walls is, is happy to, to be our presenter. So Prof. Walls and I go back an enormously long way, at least 20 minutes. Um, he graduated from BITS uh, some time ago, and he is a structural engineer who specializes in fire engineering. This is very significant because most people who do fire designs have trained specifically in fire engineering, um, but they don't necessarily always appreciate the broader picture. Um, and within engineering, it's always important that you understand the broad context of the discipline you work in. Um, and so coming from a structural background is really, really helpful. Um, and you'll find this in your careers as you go forward that the more transdisciplinary you can be and the more you can understand what other people do, the more valuable your engineering contribution becomes. Um, when we asked Prof. Walls to, um, to present to us, he came back with three different presentations. Um, and we were looking for something like an introduction to fire engineering. But his topics were a lot more interesting, as you can see. Um, and so an arsonist's guide to burning down parliament was one of three options, all of which were pretty uh, provocative. And uh, so we we're very excited to have this one, particularly because it's so topical at the moment um, with Parliament having burnt down largely um, at the beginning of the year and government still trying to work out what to do about it. So I'm not sure if Prof. Walls is going to give us any answers as to where Parliament will be located in the future, but that's not his job. But he can hopefully educate us on the fundamentals that you need to know about to ensure that your buildings don't burn down. So if I can hand over to you. Okay, evening everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I hope everyone online can hear me. Oh well. Okay, welcome all. It's good to, to join you um, for the, the SIC um, Western Cape uh, meeting. So just going to give a bit of an overview to um, tonight's talk. Firstly, um, somewhat of an inspiration of this talk, C.S. Lewis's diabolical ventriloquism. What on earth are you talking about? Um, if you've ever read, there's a, a book called Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote Chronicles of Narnia and uh, various other books. And um, it's a fictional book, but it's basically about these two demons having a discussion of how do we, like, tempt this guy and get him to do um, all sorts of things. And it's sometimes useful to, to come from the other side and look, you now how would we be the bad guy, be on the other side, cause the chaos, and because when anything you build, design, there is possibly someone who will want to destroy it um, at, for whatever reason. I mean, we just look at the riots in South Africa and the amount of buildings that got destroyed after uh, former President Zuma got arrested and various other things. So this, this happens. Now, um, just the second point, when I posted this, the, the, the topic online, post on LinkedIn, hey, you know, come listen, the, one of the first responses with, with um, uh, with, with load shedding, this may be a very useful talk. So um, anyone a member of Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, IRA, um, what's it, Al-Shabaab, uh, Blue Bulls? Um, okay, so the, the, the outline of talk going to be the importance of Swiss cheese. You will see why Swiss cheese is important just now. Um, in disasters, when things go wrong, etc. Um, from spark to disaster, so setting up a fire and, and setting up some destruction. Can we make it look like an accident? Can we cause some large-scale destruction so that no one would know? Uh, can we make it so that we will not get caught? Um, unlike the, the totally bizarre thing that's actually playing out with the parliament fire and the guy just wandering around for a few hours. Um, then going for collapse, how do we actually get to a point of inducing structural failure, collapse, and then to have victims or not to have victims, that is the question. And those will be part of the, the to um, topics we will be, be looking at. So now, firstly, what, the importance of Swiss cheese, and doesn't matter what you are designing, whatever you do has holes in Um can be a building, can be a pipe network, can be whatever it is, there will be something with, with pitfalls in it. 
And the Swiss cheese model is one way to look at it. Basically, if I were to hold up a whole bunch of uh, slices of Swiss cheese in front of my face, it would be good when you can't see me, it's bad when you can see me. The more slices you add, the more likely something is to be safe because no system is bulletproof. Even if you were wanted to be safe from intruders and you were the president and you got the army around you to protect you, it's possible that the army could be the one that then just overthrows you as we've seen around the world in, in various military coups. So it doesn't matter what system it is, there are always shortcomings. So you have multiple levels of safety. And the more levels there are, the, more li the, the less likely something is to go wrong. And that's quite a, a thing to think about is nothing's bulletproof. No something can go wrong. And what happens if something does go wrong? What happens if the backup system does need to kick in? And so it's, it's, you have hazards, you have various layers of protection where the loss is prevented. But if it gets through, the loss is not prevented. And even in our engineering design, this is always in the background, there's always a probability of failure. Clients don't like that. If they ask you, is my building safe? And you're like, no, not really. It's there's a you know, one in a million chance of this failing or you know, just the probability of failure is relatively low. They may not appreciate that, but there is always a chance of failure. Even if you design something well, and you crash a plane into it, it's, that's that. So there will always be some way to attack your system, to destroy your system. And as an arsonist, you would want to remove as many layers as possible. How are you going to progressively knock out more and more to cause destruction, to cause spread, and to take um, this around the building? So how can we get to the stage where your, your incident makes meme status, where you can make national, um, make national news with your, your incidents that you have caused? And, and um, I quite appreciated this one, and there, there were many others. And so can we get to that stage? Can we get to the stage where what should have been a small incident can cost 2 billion rand? That's the current price tag on the incident, 2 billion rand. And that's excluding secondary costs, relocations, flights up and down, bookings, all sorts of things. That's the preliminary price tag this country has received. Never mind all the laws that may not have been passed and all the other things that haven't happened because of an incident like this. You're talking billions and billions of rands. So before we get into that, we need a bit of physics in the background. And um, the flame is one of the best ways to illustrate the best um, to the basic physics. And ultimately, everything comes down to this, this physics. When we want to cause destruction, we have a fire triangle. We have oxygen. We have fuel. And we have heat. Wherever you bring sufficient quantities of those three together, you have combustion. And there's various ways that they can come together. If you remove any one of those, you're not successful. So in a candle, your fuel is the wax. I always thought when I was young, it was that little wick burning. It kind of looks like it's burning, but it's, it's the, the, the wax primarily. It's a, a hydrocarbon-based material. You have radiation energy coming down and then creating a gas. First, these solids don't burn, gases burn. You have to convert everything. doesn't matter if it's the timber in front of you, the chair you're sitting on. You're all sitting on hydrocarbon. You're all sitting on um, oil-based products which burn like hell. Um, they have to be converted into a gas first. They move up into the flame zone. There's oxygen coming in from the side. And then there is a small flame zone. And if you had equipment sensitive enough, you'd measure about 2,000 degrees Celsius in that flame zone. Even in a little candle, it's about 2,000 degrees Celsius. If you burnt it in pure oxygen and you had, um, you could measure it fast enough, it'd be close on 6,000 degrees Celsius, the instantaneous temperature. We can't measure like that. But um, so you have a, a ignition source. The, the flame um, has started on the couch. You have your little 1,000, 2,000 degrees Celsius. It ignites. At that point in time, what happens is the, the gases start rising. You create a hot layer at the roof. And um, the, this layer gets, gets hotter and hotter. Um, at around 500, 600 degrees Celsius, you will see then this, this layer really starting to get active, really starting to move across. 
and you have flashover. Basically, it's an instantaneous change from a hot layer to everything in the room um, burning down, where you go from one layer of hot at the top, one layer of cold at the bottom, to the whole room on fire. So that is post flashover. You see there, wherever there is oxygen, there is combustion, because at this stage, the fire is running out of air. It burns where the air is. So often the flames you see coming out the window is actually the fire looking for air. Um, you can create large fires where you starve it. Um, we've been involved in one large scale um, incident where also another probably close on 2 billion rands worth of losses for South Africa and massively oxygen starved. Long window and it just but this 40 meter deep compartment and it couldn't burn into the compartment because it couldn't get the air. And so you had the slot of flame at the window, but into the compartment, very cold. And so if we want to go to cause destruction, we need to bring those through um, three together, heat, oxygen, fuel. Any one of them run out, you stop it. When we put water on the fire, what we're actually doing is cooling it down. Um, we think we're, we're stopping a chemical reaction. We're actually just cooling it and we're getting it below the spontaneous ignition temperature. When you um, put a big blanket on a fire, you're removing the oxygen. Um, and uh, the, the, the fun thing with, with removing oxygen, if you don't get it right, then, then things can really go pear-shaped because um, you get backdrop. And so you remove the oxygen, you close up a room, and um, then there's a buildup of those gases. And then someone arrives, open the doors, you introduce um, air, and suddenly there's a fireball that, that comes out of the room causing destruction. Many a firefighter has lost their lives. But now this, this is our target. The, there is the, the parliament building. So this is, this is all from Google. This is nothing sensitive. And just think about now how would we turn a lighter, a match, a small spark, a coffee machine into to a disaster? I mean, just start thinking about now how would you cause a fire to move around that building um, heritage building, there's looking around, there's looking inside. And so you're going to get some very interesting fire dynamics going on in that structure. It's quite a high roof. So what I showed you earlier, there was a hot layer that built up. It radiated energy down. Once the radiation is high enough, then everything ignites all at once. You get that, that flash of a phenomenon. Now, in a place like that, let's say something overheats, a politician overheats, um, the hot layer spreads out. Um, this roof is too high for flash oil. You're not going to get a spontaneous ignition of uh, everything through the room. You're going to get a traveling fire scenario where one thing will move to the next. So from locally, it would move from seat to seat to seat um, all the way through. If It would ignite the roof and then spread, but you wouldn't have full room involvement like you have in a small enclosure. So the dynamics are very, very different. And um, also in a place like this, you'd have um, probably sprinklers, there are people watching, um, you can get in there, you can access it. So if this, this might not be the best place to start the fight. Uh, probably CCTV TV cameras, rumor has it they weren't being monitored, um, maybe there are people around. So this, this would lead to, to destruction, but there are various things that would influence it. So there is also a lot of, of timber and things. And when we see wood, we think, hey, that's that's the thing to target. Wood equals fire, bry equals burning. There's far worse in that room. There's far better things to, to burn. Um, as I said, the seats you're sitting on are polyurethane. Polyurethane is crude oil refined and expanded. So it's not just solid wood. It's now expanded into a nice foam, which heats up more quickly. The, the, um, the heat onto it causes the surface to heat up faster, you get faster gases. Uh, the <clears throat> energy content of wood is about 17 megajoules per kilogram. The contents of what you're sitting on is about 46. So you're talking two to three times the, the energy um, in plastics, foams, et cetera, than timber. So timber's not your target. Timber burns way too slowly. Uh, you want synthetics. Synthetics um, are the, the thing that cause spread. And modern in buildings, Modern, uh, modern buildings, flashovers sometimes are occurring twice as fast as it used to in the past. We have cottons and, I mean, uh, leathers and cottons and sort of natural products. Things are much faster these days now that everything is synthetic. So this, this is also not a good place. You've got lots of non-combustibles, marble and cladding and bricks and, and all sorts of things. But at least 
This is now lower roofs, so you may have faster um, spread of gases and smoke through. And also smoke is what um, is dangerous for people. Um, smoke is what kills people, not, not flames. Uh, most people, when bodies are found normally, it is, it is smoke that has, has caused the, the destruction. So, yeah, there, yeah, a little bit more fuel. Maybe those are synthetic. We've got some nice drapes um, that can pull it up. Ideally, is if we have large areas of um, synthetics on the wall. Those are great because that will move the flame like nothing else. Um, if you have ever nightclub disaster, Kiss nightclub, Rhode Island nightclub, there was one in Thailand recently. When you have 50, 100 deaths, it's the cladding. Beautiful synthetic silk nylon drapes on the side. And it just runs like hell. Um, and the door is locked and there's bouncers and no one knows where to go and all those sorts of things. So we're continuing our, our uh, walk around Parliament. And so let's get started. Let's see now how can we make this look like an accident. We want to now start, start a fire, start a bit of a distraction. What can we do that people may not suspect? Um, so there, there are various ways and means of doing it. One great thing is batteries. Batteries are a great way. There are now lithium ion batteries in scooters, in skateboards, in hover, I mean, in backups, energy systems. This poor guy does not know what's going on. It, it did not end well. Um, his, his little electrical scooter was charging at the wall outlet and uh, the, there was thermal runway. So just think about a battery. Yep. And look how fast this is, this is um, all happening. This is real speed. This is not accelerated. You're talking in a matter of minutes. Um, the entire room is full of noxious smoke. You have all sorts of nasty chemicals that you do not want to, to play with. Um, so let's just see if I can pause this for a sec. So we are now putting large battery banks in places. And um, if you wanted to make it look like an accident, you bring your hoverboard or give me your scooter, um, you have your um, battery backups for buildings. So now we, in a, in a building, we have load shedding. So you have an entire floor full of lithium ion batteries, you know, large quantities of these materials. And just think about it this way. You have something that stores energy. And normally it would be petrol uh, that you would use to function a machine. It's those sorts of levels of energy you have in that system and uh, once it hits thermal runway, it just accelerates from the one to the next, to the next, to the next, and smoke and fuel. And also, if it's, whoopsie, apologies. If it is a, um, a car, for instance, you, you, it might be a great way. Let's take our Tesla, park it inside. And there's charging stations we now put in buildings. So maybe we can, it, it'll look like an accident. It's just next to the charging station. It's charging. There was something went wrong. And uh, now you've got all these cars lined up, which are all, um, you yeah, so you've got five electric vehicle charging bays in a row in a building, and they're all now heavily um, full of synthetics and foams and plastics and such, and you can hit it. There, um, Liverpool, there were, I think it was over a thousand cars burnt out in one incident. Um, historically, car parks, from a structural perspective, were told to be safe. You know, you didn't design structural car parks um, for fire resistance because they would, the cars can catch fire, and when they did, they then it all like, sweet. Now um, we have the Liverpool car park to, to deal with. So that would be one way. Another way to perhaps cause some, some interesting flames, we need someone on the inside though. We need someone in the kitchen. So um, start a bit of a, um, a, a fire on the stove, get a bit of cooking oil, leave it there a bit too long. And then um, after that, we want to then get it going quickly. So this is just water and that is a, an oil fire. Um, so there's nothing sinister. It's oil fire, and we're going to put the fire out um, until you create a steam cloud. Um, you drop water in. Steam is far larger than water, and it actually creates a jet, a flame that throws it into the air, into uh, everywhere in the area, and you can cause lots of chaos in the, the kitchen. So the, that can happen, though, on a much larger scale as well. Um, so. This, this is a silo, and um, at the roof, those are precast concrete slabs. And uh, the reason they're missing is because of the same reason. Those precast slabs, which are about six meters long and 
you know, 100 mils thick and a couple a meter wide, got thrown off the top. A um, 3,000 tons of, of uh, maize inside, a conveyor belt at the top, something dropped down, 3,000 tons started burning. Oh, hell, the guys managed. They got 2,900 tons out fairly quickly. But maize still burns. Um, yeah, they maybe had found a lot of um, popcorn at the end. I'm not sure. But it's still a biomass. Biomass burns. We use biomass now to generate energy. And still 100 tons is still 100 tons of fuel. And it can burn. It burned for a month. It took them a month. One of the reasons it also burned for a month, it was burning. They arrived, they put water on, like, let's get this thing out fast. But it was an enclosed space with suddenly a very large volume of steam created, and it literally blew the roof off. So this would be another way of causing chaos. The, the, on the left is where the precast concrete landed. That used to be a vehicle. Um, and that's what it, it, and then that is the precast concrete panel on the floor. It looked small in the last picture, but now you can see how big that was. So... You can get some funny things with pressure waves and explosions going through. And um, explosions themselves, you can have some very, very weird things blowing up at times um, when we're not aware of, of what's going on. So on this, this is, this is it. Smoldering away slowly but surely. Um, difficult to get in there, difficult to see, and then especially when you've got a layer of material. Smoldering fires are great if you want to give the... the fire department an absolute headache because they will creep for hours. Uh, parliament, fire popped up an hour, a few hours, many hours later. You just need something smoldering away with a little bit of fuel, low oxygen environment, and it will just fester away and um, gradually tunnel its way through. And unless you've killed it, um, it's going to pop back up. You have peat fires, a peat, you know, like a old boggy, you've got this biomass material in layers. In, in some countries, you know, Scotland Island, they burn it. There are peat fires that have literally been lasting, the number escapes me now, decades. Um, it gets into the growth and it'll just burn there for, for decades. It's the, the longest fires in history. It's that smoldering thing. And if you can get that into a building, you find something that's combustible and you, the fire there, they, to get in there and get rid of it, especially if this is an avoid space, which we'll, we'll get to just now. So, um, yeah, so, and also, we, we want, if we want a disaster, room fire is not good enough. A building designed properly with those Swiss la layers of Swiss cheese in place, a fire can always start. You can always have the coffee machine overheat. Um, fees must fall. The night of my PhD defense, this building was, was firebombed. Uh, I kid you not, thankfully, they didn't get it right. Um, we found out the next day. Um, so the, these things happen. Uh, as if there's an electrical fault, there's lights can overheat. Something can happen. But the, the layers of Swiss cheese should keep it in one place. When things go really pear-shaped is when you don't keep it in one place. When you have um, something like this, let me just show you, Grenfell Tower, um, 72 dead. That is aluminum composite material panels on the wall. Uh, basically, it's about a 5 mil, 6 mil layer of material, which is pure hydrocarbon. You're talking five liter, roughly five liters of petrol per square meter of facade. There are facades all over the world clad with that stuff. Um, Santon, um, Cape Town, wouldn't surprise me. I don't know which buildings are and aren't. Um, overseas, there was one a week ago in, where was it? Uh, I think it was Italy, I can't remember now. Um, oh, sorry, it was China. Had a, another um, ACM aluminium composite material building um, by of China. And um, these are fantastic for energy efficiency. So there was a huge move from the energy efficiency guys for years promoting low uh, conductivity, cheap, colorful. This is fantastic. And the fire guys in the back are, wait, hold on. <laughs> this is not a good idea. And then um, Grenfell, if you compromise your compartmentation, that's it. This, this had a stay in, this, um, this building, there, there, there was no Swiss cheese left. It just, there, there was nothing left. Um, they had a stay in place um, fire scenario. So if, if the fire breaks out, don't evacuate the building. Stay where you are because you're safer than if you go into the single stairwell in the middle. So um, then people would phone and the fire department's like, hey, stay where you are. Uh, 72 deaths later, um, when that goes up. So this, this happens. The, the number one thing is if you have combustible claddings, large areas of thin material, which is synthetic-based, 
that is where you will have problems. But you also, this is where it comes back to, we need to get rid of the layers of Swiss cheese. These are a couple of high-rise fires, major ones, where you're talking um, you know, between 18 and 79 floors. These are big buildings. Um, if you have a look, Grenfell Tower, look, uh, 20, 24 floors, but have a look, 72 fatalities. But then go down the list, Ajman One Towers, The Address, Nasa Tower, Marina Torch, ironic name, La Crosse Building, Mermos Tower. Of those other six building, two fatalities. Why? This was cheese once again. There were other systems in place that protected the buildings. An alarm system that would let the whole building go. So, guys, something, everyone evacuate. Not a stay-in-place system. So, that's one of the things you've got to look at. If a system fails, what might be the implications and everything else? You know, a stay-in-place system is fine as long as you've got compartmentation, as long as the fire stays where you thought it would. As soon as you lose compartmentation, that's the end. Um, that system goes, and then you end up with, with the Grenfell Tower at the bottom, in, at the top, where the rest of them, the, the other systems came into play and kept the people safe. And uh, also it would just depend on were there people around, um, people also your first responders. They see, they notice, they do something, they phone the fire department. If it's an empty building, you may have more debt, I mean, more destruction, less debt. So <clears throat> now this is a, uh, a famous disaster. This is the MGM building. So I just want to get to the right section. My tablet. Okay. So this, that is a lift shaft and have a look how there is smoke coming out of buttons. And, um, this was a famous uh, incident a few decades ago um, in Las Vegas. Quite a lot of people died. I think it was about 80 people died. And um, it, it raced through the building. And now then investigation started. This is just some sections from a documentary. And then you'll have a look there. Those are seismic vents. And those were put to isolate sections of the building from one another. But what it did is it created long channels that connected all the floors together in one continuous sprawl. So if you compromise that, you basically have a chimney effect that can pump um, smoke throughout the building. And they would, they would find bodies lying on the floor just overcome by smoke. Nothing was burnt there. It was literally just the smoke that would, would get to you. And so whenever you have long, um, uh, long continuations, or at least I'll get to Bruce Willis now, um, so if you have continuous spans that can connect zones together, those are as dangerous as they come because those will lead to, um, compartmentation loss, smoke spread and, and rapid failure. And especially if there's combustibles such as cables, most of your cables are wrapped in plastic. One cable fine, but now you've got a cable rack or 100 cables that run the length of the building, and PVC pipes, and all sorts of other stuff, and insulation to keep things cool. And it's, it's in, a, in a duct. So what you do is the, the IT guys have been running cables, and then there's another power line and et cetera over the years. And those are, those, if you're going to cause destruction, start there, because you can get it to run the length of the building. If no one's thought about fire stopping it at zones, it will spread through. And... Um, also, it is out of the way of your sprinkler systems often. Sprinkler systems will often kick in. But firstly, before we get that, we're just going to have a look at a couple of myths, Hollywood myths about sprinklers. So um, normally in a, in a movie, though, it's that, that moment where something needs to happen. You know, the, the hero or the villain needs to cause some chaos. And so um, uh, I think this is a Die Hard movie or one of those. You know, either you, you, you pull one button or you set off one sprinkler and suddenly the entire room... Um, is wet. You know, you, you, you take your little lighter at the one sensor, it goes off and bang, the whole room now starts flooding. Uh, no, only one activates at a time from heat where you are. So um, that, that, that's not true. It only, it needs enough heat as well, which also means is that it needs heat. So if you can put it high enough, it does sweep nothing. So if you have a large atrium and there's a sprinkler up there, by the time that thing activates, you're in trouble. So um, that's where engineering design comes into it and, and fluids to say, well, where should these things be to, to activate and actually do something about it? And as I was saying, if we wanted to cause destruction, we get it into the, um, 
apologies. This is not changing. Okay, it's it's wanting us to watch this a few times for some odd reason. Anyways, so um, if you can keep away from the detection systems, that will then compromise a lot. And it's often those little nooks and crannies where people don't think about. And now, when it comes across to an old building, you've got something that's what, 100 years old, been modified, who knows how many times. Um, there are security procedures in place. So getting in there to do any work is a problem. You don't want contractors running around. There have been cables and IT and security cameras and all sorts of added over. You will have ducts and voids and old ceiling insulation systems from who knows when. And you get into those voids and it can spread around. And so this is, this is the before, and that's the after. Major destruction, spread. Now, how do you get a fire from there all the way to there? Should never happen. Should never happen. Uh, then, then you know there's been, there ain't no cheese left. Um, you, you see straight through from one side to another. And um, even if there was no compartmentation, the sprinkler should, should have kicked in. But hey, if the sprinkler valve was actually turned off, um, oops, like it was, um, if there were fire doors, and the fire doors had little latches put on them to keep them open so you wouldn't have to keep swiping your card when you go through. That, that would also be, be useful. So those are all things that, that contribute to a 2 billion rand um, uh, loss. So, and then you, you end up with, with something like that where you have multi-compartment um, losses. And then the fire department, now where do you start? Uh, where do you go in? Who, who is in there? Um, and how do you, you know, put it all out when you've got it spreading from one zone to another? You're not sure what it looks like on the inside. Maybe the, the um, hydrants haven't been checked in a while, and maybe it doesn't fit your equipment involved in one project at the moment. One of the reasons it went so pear-shaped was because the infrastructure was so old, it didn't fit the fire department's um, equipment. It hadn't been updated in under 50 years or something like that. So all these things contribute to a, a rapidly spreading disaster. And especially, as I said, if we get it into a void and there's some nice ceiling voids, especially behind your, um, your sheeting. You've got funny layers there between a ceiling and the roof. And um, it's now chock-a-block of dust and who knows what else. And dust can explode as well, so then you can even get uh, more interesting things if there's a sufficient dust buildup and if it's a biomass or any other type of dust, sugar dust, uh, most types of dust. If there's enough energy, um, you, know, you have a uh, even flower. You put a, a burst of flower and you, you light it and you can get a, an, a dust explosion. So you can have something moving all the way along and through and in a place where the fire department just cannot get to it. Because now it's burning between too hard for the ceiling and then the roof. And um, they're just seeing smoke coming out from above their heads without being able to find it. So those are major, major, major challenges that have to be, be done. And once you also, then you get external flaming, and then it can start spreading. And what's even can add to this is if you flaming, um, flaming particles, brands. So if now you have something which produces lots of small pieces, uh, this can make it a whole lot worse. So especially um, in, in a wildfire, I mean, if the trees there started burning and the wind's blowing, the, the tree burns, it burns the leaves and it blows these, these little leaves across. Same thing as the structure is burning, there might be old timber, thatch, um, plastic, something. If a bit of wind picks it up, it blows it. And then it just floats along and it lands somewhere. And that gutter hasn't been cleaned in a while and there's just some leaves in it. Nothing sinister, just some leaves. And if you have enough of those, 100,000 launched with a big wind blowing behind it, you can even have spread to other parts, into the gutter, into your roof, and that's where you lose most homes in wildfires. Uh, Neisner, 1,000 homes, a um, couple of billion rand, primarily ember attack. Primarily small pieces carried long distances. Long distances, 2.8 kilometer long distances. I mean, over mountains, over forests, um, landing, causing spot fires. And if you have enough thousand of those, you only need one. And then it, it'll, it'll run. So there's lots of other things that you can then start doing. 
And as I said, you've got contained spaces up here, um, IT systems, cables, who knows what else that will pull it from one zone to another. It's above the sprinkler system, which was off. Um, and uh, heritage materials, so um, who knows what it was made up. And so there, there you go. Um, total compartmentation loss um, spread through multiple zones and um, severe large scale destruction and uh, yeah, a total and utter mess. And uh, no Swiss cheese there. There's the inside looking up at the structure as all public domain um, photos. And uh, I mean, it's just, you're, you're lucky you haven't had structural collapse. I mean, it looks like a steel girder running there, carrying bulkheads and who knows what else, rings, compression rings, etc. But now, what happens if we wanted collapse? You know, that's, that's, that's the, the destruction, but at that stage, there's one slice of Swiss cheese that's still there, the structure. And that is your last line of defense. If that goes, then that's it. And um, that's where, the, where most um, civil engineers actually get into fire engineering is through structural fire resistance, trying to make sure that if a fire does break up, out, um, it, it is strong enough. So this is a, another national key point. Um, and what you're seeing is the remnants of a column. This is a 600 by 600 millimeter column. There's about a meter missing from it. It's a meter shorter than it used to be. And um, it literally got shattered. And um, here you can see a main facade column, major crack running that way. And there's actually bi-directional cracking. There's cracking, it's been pushed in two directions. You've got um, slabs here that have failed. Um, main sagging, exposed rebar. Now, how do you get to this stage? How do you get to a point where this is the final line of defense is overcome? And you will often see various systems for protecting structures. You put paint on, you put more concrete on, you put boards on, whatever. And people worry about things getting weak in fire. It's not a material getting weak in fire that's the danger. It's thermal expansion. It's the heating and something growing and having nowhere to go. So if you have now a compartment, a fire breaking out here, and it starts heating up the structural elements. Also, initially what happens is if you have a concrete column, the outside gets hot first. And that may get to 600, 800 degrees Celsius. It gets hot. But it's restrained by the cool in of it. So what actually happens is the outside gets hot, it expands, it goes into compression. It's trying to expand, and it's held in place by the cooler middle bit. So the resultant force is kept lower because the, the cool bit is in tension, the outer bit's in compression, but it's, it's held in place. But now, as the fire um, goes longer and longer, the heat penetrates deeper and deeper into your sample until you get to a point where even the middle now starts getting hotter and hotter. And um, in a concrete structure, a slow cool fire is more um, damaging than a short hot one. A steel structure, short hot, because the steel heats up very quickly. In a concrete, um, it can be a very a long lasting fire is far more dangerous because it takes a while to come through the concrete to the core, heat it up, and now the entire system is expanding. This concrete column probably only hit about 200 degrees Celsius. By, by structural fire engineering standards, that's cool. Um, you normally only worry about material strength loss of about 400 degrees Celsius. So 200, yeah, that's a bit heated, but if this was in a lab, you'd heat concrete to 200 degrees, you wouldn't even have any strength loss. But you heat it long enough, you zoom in on this column, the column looks like that, and um, diagonal failure. For those of you busy with third year concrete design, what do you think when you see diagonal crack? Hopefully someone has, hopefully you've covered this yet. Everyone's like, wasn't me, I'm. What type of failure? Shear. Shear failure, diagonal crack is a shear failure. So have a look at that, that that's a shear failure sideways. You're used to shear failure downwards. You've got a, a main floor beam, you're talking a 1200 by 400 floor beam, a big chunky concrete floor beam expanded for a period of time and um, heating progressively through, pushing out 
and exerting a force of about 4,000 kilonewtons. That is more than the entire column was designed for vertically was a, as a lateral force sideways. And it just punched a hole straight through that thing. Um, it burned for long enough and eventually just, just cut it in half. And um, we can be quite fortunate this didn't happen in, in other places. Not far from that column, there's a 16-story building. This, this section was five stories, and five, then, you know, the, the, the four floors above came down. If this had happened three days away, um, that could have happened to 16 stories. Um, and it would have been a colossal, colossal failure. Um, so that thermal expansion is the killer. It's this that's the problem, and it is often the edge column, because that's where it, things can, uh, can expand. It's got the least restraint. So if you're going to model the structure, you basically have a restraint there. There's a pin support force, and this one moves a little bit, that one moves more, that one moves the most. Um, F equals KX, force equals stiffness matrix times displacement, and your X is bigger. Your forces are bigger, and often your Outer columns have um, also weaker. They don't have as much axial load, half the axial load you design them for. And you often will find your failure occurring where the movement can occur. That's, or you will just have buckling. If, for instance, this had been connected there, if they had linked this to, there was a big retaining wall next door. If that had been done, you would have actually got to the stage where you might have just buckled the beam. The beam can actually just crush. Um, they were scanning electron microscope um, tests done on this concrete, and the, the, the result, it never got hot, but the thing was cracked to hell and gone just by the forces it was exerting on itself. So, this is the sort of level of disaster we've had. Uh, two billion rand loss. Um, some of you may be too young to understand the, the, the comment on the screen, but... Um, You need multiple levels of failure from your detection through to your suppression. Structural, we didn't quite get there, but hey. And um, so some conclusions. Let's start the fire in the hard to reach places. We always design it for, you, you design the, 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 the disaster normally in an easy place where you can deal with it, the systems are in place, but it's often the out of the way place that may lead to it. It's that part of the building or the pipe network or the, um, you know, whatever system you're designing, the transport network, and um, start with a hard to reach it. Multiple layers of protection need to be compromised. If there is only one slice, there's always holes. It doesn't matter what system it is. And there's always got to be backup plans to, to accommodate that. Um, basically, we need to bring flames in contact with fuel in the presence of oxygen. It, ba it obeys basic physics. You've got three ingredients, and wherever those three are together in the right proportions, you have combustion. Nothing magic. It's just obeying physics. You want to bring heat in contact with more fuel and more oxygen, and it will spread. Through everywhere it can go, um, inside the room, outside the room, progressively turning furniture, cars, lithium ion batteries, uh, whatever it encounters into fuel. Um, and... Even if those things go wrong, you have external backup, which is your fire department, coming into the site, trying to sort out the fire, trying to suppress active. And that is another line of defense. And even if they are often hindered by various things, um, you may, you, if you have um, couplings that don't fit the equipment, if they can't get there, you know, the roads are too narrow. Um, people are evacuating. So it's a high-rise building. There's one, cup, one or two or three routes in. And you've got too many people coming in, I mean, going out, so they can't come in. Um, they can't access the building. Or people are evacuating with their cars, so you can't get emergency vehicles in. So there are <coughs> multiple ways of, you know, many systems that need to, to um, be, be overcome to what should have, you know, been a small incident. You get to the early an incident early enough with a cup of coffee, you can sort out a two billion rand incident with a cup of coffee if you get there at the right second and, and douse it. As time progresses, it just gets worse and worse and worse and to a point where we now um, have the mess we have. And uh, who knows what's going to happen next with Parliament, whether it's going to be built, rebuilt here or in Pretoria. Um, yeah. Okay, so that takes us to an end of today. I was um, 
So I hope you've enjoyed that. Hopefully it's been a bit of a different perspective.